Today's uh, uh, noon lecture will be uh, introduced by Joan Key of our art history department. Before I ask Joan to come up, uh, may I say how grateful I am to Professor uh, uh, Winter Togaki for, Tamaki for uh, coming out under these uh, circumstances. Joan. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, so welcome to the Center for Japanese Studies noon lecture series. I'm Joan Key. I'm an assistant professor in the History of Art Department here at the University of Michigan. It's my great privilege and honor to introduce our speaker today, Professor Bert Winter Tamaki, associate professor at the University of California at Irvine, where he's been teaching since 1995. Professor Winter Tamaki can be regarded as one of the world's foremost authorities on the study of modern Asian art. His first book, Art and the Encounter of Nations, Japanese and American Artists in the Early Post-War Years, set a new paradigm for the study of modernity in Asian art. And I can personally attest to this be be because before Professor Winter Tamaki's book was published, I interviewed for an internship at the Metropolitan Museum for a position in contemporary art. They looked at my CV and said, how come you don't do real Asian art? And so we've come quite a long way since then. And thanks to, uh, in large part to Professor Winter Tamaki's work, which has spanned many subjects, from Isamu Noguchi to the relationship of calligraphy and post-war abstraction, to Cubism in Japan, uh, to Minoru Yamasaki, the architect of the World Trade Center. And uh, as a, in, in some part a tribute and also an acknowledgment of his work, in 2009, the Smithsonian American Art Museum organized a two-day symposium on the complex interactions between American and Asian artists based in large part on what Professor Winter Tamaki described as the cultural interdependency born out of a long and tumultuous relationship between East and West. Today's lecture comes from his new book project, Maximum Embodiment, Yoga, the Western Painting of Japan, 1912 to 1955, forthcoming from the University of Hawaii Press. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Bert Professor Winter Tamaki to Michigan. First of all, I'd like to um, thank uh, the Center for Japanese Studies and um, Jane Ozanich and Joan Key um, and Ken Ito for the honor of the invitation to come here and speak to you today. I have to confess, however, that part of me is not in this room. Part of me is at my computer, hanging on every bit of new news, worrying and about what is going on. And I'm sure that many of you feel the same way, so I'm grateful to you for, um, uh, for uh, coming away from that. Uh, and um, and looking at Japanese modern Japanese art with me today, um, it is also an honor to be here because my project is about yoga, as Joan mentioned, uh, which is literally a uh, literally means Western painting, um, uh, Japanese modern painting in oil on canvas, and um, one of the figures. Um, who was very important to me was a professor here uh, named Cal French, who in the 1970s um, did some very interesting work on the artist Shiba Kolkan. And uh, that artist in the Edo period looked at European painting and, and studied it very intensively and worked experimentally with it. And my topic is a much later stage in Japanese engagement with European oil on canvas. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let me turn off these lights. Can you, Jane, can you turn them on? Oh, there they go. Um, <clears throat> and yeah. Um, what I'd like to do is see how did that how do I get rid of that? This one? No, 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 at the very bottom. This? I'm a Mac uh, user and this is a little different. Okay, thank you. Um, so what I'd like to do is examine the way 
others, especially other bodies, are sought by this medium of oil on canvas. And um, I'm uh, going to look at these three artists, Matsuoka Hisashi, Kitagawa Tamiji, and Fukuzawa Ichiro. Um, uh, and I'm ch I chose these artists in order to resist three distinct tendencies in views of this medium and movement of yoga Western pan painting in Japan. Uh, the first tendency I want to resist is the view that France is the primary source of Japanese uh, engagements with, with uh, oil painting. The French art was kind of the be all and end all for Japanese yoga painters. The second is a kind of regret for the non-Japanese-ness that is fundamental to this kind of art, uh, to, to yoga. And third, the third tendency I want to resist is that um, there is a huge gap between those aspects of uh, yoga which are avant-garde and those aspects of yoga which are academic or academically realistic. Um, because actually there are many uh, shared properties between these two branches of what um, uh, is the yoga movement, the broader uh, yoga movement. I also want to um, address, or at least keep in mind, the very biting acerbic caustic critique um, uh, by James Elkins of what he calls modernist painting outside Europe and America, outside the trajectory. Um, I wouldn't pay any attention to this if it weren't somebody who was quite so important to my work. Other things he've writ he's written have been very important to me, but he claims that structurally you can't write about painting such as yoga, which is outside uh, Europe and America, because it's limited, this is one of his words, limited in importance to its own local context. It's uninteresting to the larger trajectory of modernist thought. Thirdly, it's misinformed by, about metropolitan advances and concepts of modernism. And fourthly, it's belated in its grasp of Euro-American avant-garde. So rather than engaging him on his own terms, I want to take his whole th four-point argument and put it aside in the sense of making it provincial to uh, what I think is really central and really interesting about yoga painting. So um, <clears throat> I'd like to look at other bodies. Uh, Italian bodies investigated and sought and encountered by Matsuoka Hisashi in the 1880s. Then jump 50 years and look at Mexican bodies encountered and mediated by uh, Kitagawa Tamiji in oil on canvas, and then finally um, uh, Fukuzawa Ichiro and uh, the Chinese um, abject body that you see a detail of here. So um, uh, moving to Matsuoka, um, <coughs> he uh, went to Italy in the 1880s, and this is one of his most famous paintings, and it depicts a uh, Bersuglieri that is a member of the elite corps of the Italian army, the Royal Italian Army. This was an important patriotic symbol in Italy. Um, these uh, soldiers were um, uh, famous for their um, plumage. You see the black feathers coming out of his, his hat. It was kind of a symbol of them. And um, uh, they had committed heroic feats uh, in the Risorgimento. Uh, the unification of Italy. And this was tremendously important, politically important, um, to Meiji Japanese such as Matsuoka because it was seen as an important analogy to the Meiji Restoration. And King Vittorio Emmanuel II was likened to the Meiji Emperor. And in fact, the dates of these historical events, Japan and Italy, coincide quite closely, 1868, the Meiji Shin, and 1870 or so, the um, uh, unification of, of Italy. 
Um, <clears throat> so what do we say? What kind of a body has Matsuoka uh, attained here? I think I agree with the curator Mori Hitoshi, um, who says Matsuoka was part of this heroic Meiji generation that struggled in every field and succeeded in attaining modernization and parity with uh, the Western powers. So here's a body that resonates with that triumph, with that cultural triumph, that uh, sense of mod modernization and parity. Um, but to understand uh, how it was attained, um, uh, we followed the artist to, uh, to Rome um, and, and see how he pursued a program of academic training. There were lots of artists who did this, who went from Japan. Um, and I'm actually showing you a particularly uh, uh, interesting example by another artist, uh, uh, Kane Kogi Takeshiro, of standard exercise in the academy. You um, sit in front of a nude, living nude model, and you render the uh, flesh and the skin and the shadows and the light and the anatomy of, uh, of the figure you see. And Kano Kogi does so in a very um, sort of almost uh, a way that uh, suggests a kind of almost menacing sexuality, which was one of the dimensions of the uh, body encounters that were part of the acquisition of academic realism. But there were others. For instance, some students um, went into morgues and participated or watched the dissection of cadavers. Uh, so that was part of it. And also, of course, uh, going to m the Louvre and to the great museums and rendering careful copies of heroic images of European bodies was, uh, was another part of it. Matsuo Kaisashi um, was the best trained of all the Meiji artists in his generation. He went to Rome at eight, age 18 and um, took a five-year course uh, and graduated with honors at the Royal Art Academy of Rome. Um, and he was part of, this is interesting, he was part of the retinue of the Marquis of Nabeshima from Saga. Uh, the retinue, uh, he was the ambassador to Rome from the Meiji government. So the acquisition of this kind of art was an acquisition of a cultural property seen as fundamental to the needs of the state. Very different milieu from um, the later uh, uh, painters that we'll be looking at. Um, <clears throat> so, of course, many people do study uh, the kind of bodies that we look at in yoga in contrast to the kinds of bodies that are featured in Nihonga painting, um, which is this other uh, great branch of modern Japanese painting that moves in parallel. You have yoga, so-called Western painting, and Nihonga, so-called Japanese painting. And this comparison is a kind of caricature of assumptions about the different specializations of these two kinds of art. So that yoga is directed toward the acquisition of European bodies in a European mode of painting them and studying, studying them, whereas Nihonga, sometimes called a neo-traditional uh, kind of art, um, it is focused in, in this case on a medieval Japanese warrior. And this is Minamoto no uh, uh, Tametomo, uh, the warrior, w one of the heroes in the tale of Hogen, uh, who has a uh, left arm that's six inches longer than the right one and is a legendary archer. Um, so uh, a very different kind of body. Uh, one is literary, one is from the past, one is European, one is Japanese, and so on. But um, it also entails differences such as the format of the artifactual quality of the painting. One tends to be framed in a great gilded bit of carpentry and the other one mounted on uh, uh, silk and, and actually painted on silk too. 
Um, but it also entails a very different way of looking at the human physiognomy um, that uh, has to do with the materials used, too, the material of oil-based pigments as opposed to water-based pigments, and, um, and these habits, these stylistic habits of uh, seeing the face cloaked in shadow, penetrating insight, and so on, versus the linear caricatural mode of the, um, the Nihonga uh, type face. Um, here's another painting, actually five years earlier. Both were done in Italy by Matsuoka, um, which is a portrait. It's an interesting portrait. It has inscribed on the back a message that says that this is a portrait of a man named Luciano who was dressed in the clothes of, uh, of Pietro Mica. Um, uh, and Pietro Mica was a, a hero in the city of Turin in the 18th century who was uh, greatly admired in the new 19th century nationalist histories for his sacrifice. He ignited dynamite in order to save the city of Turin from the French. So that is all being invoked through the medium, you might say, of the living body of this young Italian man who um, either consented or was hired to uh, sit as the model for um, Matsuoka in, in Italy. <clears throat> and, and, then, and then this artist comes home, um, and that is a kind of, a, you know, that is like a critical juncture in this pattern. He comes home to, um, to Meiji, Japan, and what we can see here is how he imposes on the body of his own father. Um, the architecture of uh, body training that he has absorbed in, in, uh, in Italy. Um, so you might call this the Baroque portrait, yeah? and you might actually, I mean, isn't it odd? We almost wonder if um, only Matsuoka Rin, that is the artist's father, had been younger at the time of this uh, portrait, he might have looked even more similar uh, to uh, Pietro Mica, his nose is already similar. The angle of the eyes, the uh, the the beard is almost analogous in a, a very curious way. So um, uh, to appreciate uh, this in terms of contemporary body theory, ideas about the body, it's not just an image of a body, because part of what makes a human body a human body is images. So this is an image which is informing the uh, body itself. Uh, the very idea of turning a body into a fleshy light bulb of intelligence that is set in a kind of a dark ground is um, a very extraordinary idea. And this seems to be the way the artist is reimagining his own father after coming back from Italy. Now I'm uh, jumping to um, uh, Kitagawa Tamiji, 50 years later, and we're going from, um, excuse me, we're going uh, from Italy to Mexico. Um, and some of the same ethnographic interests are apparent, even though this painting is so, so different. That is to say, both entail an interest, a strong interest, in clothing. The clothing of uh, the uh, Italian this, uh, dressed as Pietro Mica and the Rebojo and the way uh, the Mexicans dress in this, um, in this scene that we see on the left. And of course the ethnography goes far beyond that. Uh, where we see the interest in the church and the stone wall and the cemetery and the uh, and the, the the processions of people, but it's um, it, it's not just ethnography. Maybe ethnography is never just ethnography, but it's certainly not just ethnography here because um, it entails a perspective 
on a rural Mexican village life that comes from New York. Uh, because before uh, Kitagawa's 15 years in Mexico, um, he spent five years in New York City. And he studied art at the Art Students League under the famous American painter John Sloan, who was extremely interested in Mexico and had various contacts and people were going back and forth. And there was a kind of a, well, a rap about what is of interest in Mexican culture that had to do with this folkloric uh, kind of exoticism and a, and a bit of fantasy, you might say. Um, so that's coming into this painting. Uh, for instance, um, uh, the particular conflation of a baptism, I don't know if I have a pointer here, I do, uh, the, a baptism. So here this woman is going to take her baby all the way up to the church and get baptized. But here there is a funeral for a, um, a, an infant. There's a tiny coffin being carried on the head of this guy. Um, so there's this kind of uh, twisting and interest and, and some kind of gesture toward local folklore and the use of the clouds as like two little curtains in the top of the proscenium of a stage or something. Um, but not only that, if you look at this detail, it's this bizarre sort of bathing scene in the middle of the village uh, church landscape. And that was extracted and then made into a, another painting um, that has a, a very picturesque quality, a very uh, deliberately naive kind of quality, especially look at the way the leaves and the trees and the arch that it's uh, bracketed in and the radiating pattern of the waves of the water beneath them. Um, but also look at the... Uh, nose, <laughs> this lizard-like, like a taper with the prehensile kind of a nose that can dip and grasp, or perhaps it can. Um, so this is not an, an other body that we can think of as some kind of, well, real encounter with Mexican human beings. This is rather that no mode of exoticism that's in excess. It's operating over time. It's um, a kind of bizarre fantasy. And one way of thinking about it is to compare it to the Japanese-American painter Yasuo Kuniyoshi, the uh, most successful Asian-American artist of his generation, who um, Kitagawa also knew during his five years in New York at the uh, St Art Students League. Um, Kuniyoshi also involved himself in a style of painting that entails this exoticism that uh, tends almost to the bizarre. And my way of understanding this tendency in both cases, these are uh, Japanese artists in uh, artistic environments where it was odd to be from Japan. It was very, very exceptional. In fact, in Kuniyoshi's environment in New York City in the 1920s, uh, the critics were writing things like, this Japanese man comes to our shores like a creature from another planet. That's a paraphrase, but the term another planet as a reference to how very, very eccentric and different Japan was thought to be. That part is not a paraphrase. That was actually uh, the kind of things that uh, American critics said about Kuniyoshi. And somehow absorbing this kind of uh, uh, extreme othering gaze and in a way catering to it is uh, what seems to drive this tendency toward the bizarre exoticism. Here, you know, the woman was likened to a big hen who was laying an egg and it was seen as bizarre oriental humor and so Kuniyoshi was um, uh, uh, no doubt playing up to that. So now, just one year later, and suddenly, at least from this comparison, suddenly we go from that extreme, bizarre exoticism to this gripping, I see you uh, kind of uh, interaction 
with um, Mexican children. And um, part of this has to do with um, the fact that uh, Kitagawa was a teacher. And he came to Mexico, and he was very successful as an art teacher. And he joined the very important uh, movement uh, of called, uh, that's called open air art schools in Mexico in this period. And in fact, he was so successful that he was uh, appointed the director of his own open air art school in the city of uh, the small town, all the way in the south of Mexico in the state of Guerra, the town of Pasco. And it was here that he was teaching art to, uh, to Mexican kids. And he uh, later became quite well known uh, in the field of art pedagogy and wrote quite a bit about it and wrote retrospectively about his own experience of teaching Mexican kids. And um, he said two things that are rather perhaps contradictory. He said that on the one hand, he um, w w was interested not in a hierarchical relationship where the teacher teaches down, tells kids what to do, but in a kind of more equal relationship, he used the term like a friend. So um, it sounds like a very uh, a humanizing uh, revision of art education. But the other thing that he emphasizes in some of his writings about teaching in Mexico is, um, well, it sounds a lot like primitivism, that these children were, were, were totally, unlike Japanese kids, he says, who would strive to make a beautiful picture, the Mexicans are innocent of that concept of art and more directly uh, apprehend their daily life. And he said another thing he admired in this very primitivizing mode of admiration, he admired them for not seeing like a camera, but um, uh, with their tactile senses, with their smell, their picture, the picture the kids are making, it can be uh, is a product of smell and touch and heart. So this kind of um, idealistic and yet primitivizing approach is uh, part of what was driving his vision here. Um, now uh, we have three I call them art ambassadors in this period from the Japanese yoga community, Western art, Western painting in Tokyo. You have. Uh, uh, the famous painter Fujita Tsuguharu in Paris, um, who is acquiring bodies, you might say, in, in Paris. And you have uh, Yasuo Kuniyoshi, who's doing the same thing in New York. Uh, and you have uh, Kitagawa in Mexico. And they know each other. And it is, a kind, it is like a foreign diplomacy, like a system of ambassadors, in that, that anybody who goes from Tokyo uh, the Tokyo art world to Mexico, they go check out uh, Kitagawa in Tasco. If they go to Paris, they have a letter of introduction to Fujita and New York to Kuniyoshi. And they visit, uh, Kuniyoshi comes from New York and visits Kitagawa in Tasco, and Fujita comes, and it's in Tasco that he makes the same, uh, the, does a similar study. Um, so uh, since Fujita is a much more famous artist in the Tokyo uh, art, modern art history, it's assumed that he influenced Kitagawa in this relationship, in this comparison, uh, with a linearity maybe of the uh, Kitagawa's brushwork here. Um, but um, I'm more interested in the disparity, uh, the distinctions between the two, because um, Fujita had this very delicate line, and he was very good at things like finessing the details, the wrinkles of the clothing, almost like a fashion designer, uh, and the puffy sort of uh, complexions of the face and so on. Whereas there's something much grimmer uh, going on in Kitagawa, and the, uh, there's much more of an, an emphasis on dark brown skin. And um, one of the other people, that was painting kids in this city of Pasco was the uh, one of Los Tres Grandes, one of the three great Mexican painters of the Mexican mural movement, uh, David Alfaro Squeros, 
who was under house arrest in Pasco at this time because of his radical political activities. Um, and he did have an encounter with um, Kitagawa. He took refuge in Kitagawa's house in Pasco, and they both painted kids. Um, but later, uh, uh, Kitagawa would write about Skeros in, in, in extraordinary terms, that his eyeballs were made of fire, that he looked like a Greek god, that he, um, you know, painted with a, uh, a sense of brashness that, uh, that is unequaled by any other living painter. He was deeply impressed with this artist. And um, something of the uh, grimness, uh, although I don't think Kitagawa's painting measures up in that sense to Skeros here, but nonetheless, something of the grimness of the vision of, uh, of these uh, Mexican children comes into this painting. But notice the title, it's not just Mexican children, it's Indian, a brother and sister. And um, in his writings, uh, uh, Kitagawa was very interested in differences between people in Mexico, the Indians, the, uh, the, the, the Spanish, and the Mestizo. And he was kind of measuring relationships there. Um, uh, and what starts to happen is that he um, develops a strong affinity for the people with brown skin. Um, and, he, and he identifies, he affiliates himself with them in this very extreme kind of way. He wrote a kind of autobiography in 1955 that was called My Mexican Youth. And in this uh, autobiography, and I really cannot evaluate how much of it is true and how much of it is fiction because it's a wild romantic adventure story, but he um, nonetheless gives an account of his personal experience of different races. First in the West Coast in the US uh, where he first arrived, then in New York City then he, on his trip f to Mexico, he first went to um, the South, the American South. And then he spent a few months in Cuba, and then finally to Mexico. And in this itinerary, there's a constant concern with different colors of skin and different kinds of racism and where it's worse, and who is the, uh, who's disadvantaged and how in different contexts. And it seems that his own experience of racism and exclusion um, in New York uh, led him to, uh, to affiliate himself with African Americans. And in, uh, in the South, he, he rode on the train that was, had segregated seating, and he rode on the uh, the, the black side. Um, and so this, this continues. Then there's a really interesting story, interesting for me because I'm studying oil painting. He was in Florida working. He was always poor. He was working hard, hard work. And he attends a nighttime uh, uh, African-American event, some kind of mysterious secret event. And again, I don't know if this really happened. It's an extraordinary story. Um, and was very dangerous. And he painted his face and his uh, hands with oil paint to disguise himself as an African American. And uh, then he participates in this strange erotic frenzy, etc. So now we see oil painting. Now that is one of the key aspects driving the development of this artistic medium from its invention in Renaissance Europe. Uh, that it's especially good for representing flesh tones and nuances of flesh tones. So um, this is what he uh, strives for. Then he um, goes to a village in Mexico and he gets sunburned and looks like the Indians who are farmers in this village and he almost gets adopted into a family. And he tries to, uh, so here is this self-othering, this sort of 
uh, a, a projection <coughs> of himself into another kind of identity. But again, a, a great deal of his interest is for gradations and differences between uh, different kinds of skin, different kinds of bodies. And here, uh, paintings that almost look like pendants, like they go together, painted in the same year. And um, Candida is said to be a woman who um, was uh, Indian, but had unusually light skin. Um, whereas Romana was a strong-armed woman who served as his house uh, keeper in his house in Tasco. Now he's the director of a uh, school and he uh, has a house and so on. Um, uh, so these kind of gradations, one has uh, makeup and has jewelry uh, candida and the other one has um, this sort of rough woolly hair and, uh, and sort of thicker, stronger kinds of arms. Now, he, I I again, I'm drawing on his writings here. He says that in this context, the, um, in Mexico, women with uh, white skin, uh, and in his, uh, in his language, no matter what their structural flaws may be, they are considered beautiful women, and they strut around with a great deal of arrogance because of that. Um, and then he differentiates himself from that context of beauty and says, for me, it's not true. And then it gets sort of graphic. He says, I prefer the brown-skinned, lice-ridden uh, prostitute to the false coquette on the cabaret. Um, uh, so uh, there's this element to his uh, primitivism, you might say, that entails uh, self-othering of an erotic uh, nature. Um, not that these are terribly erotic pictures, and the nudes don't really come at this stage in his career, but um, there is in his writings later this reference to, um, uh, to Lady Chatterley's lover. And uh, this idea that, uh, it, that he quotes, uh, it, that, that to, to know a person not by your mind, not by your intellect, not by analysis, but by your penis is the, what he, his lesson from Lady Chatterley's lover. And he extends that and says a, 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 to the nation, this, this is his term, uh, to, in other words, I learned Mexico, <laughs> you know, uh, the same way. Um, so it, it, this er erotic side to the seeking the other body is uh, critical importance here. Um, yeah, there's the quote I, I just mentioned, this uh, sort of personal preference that comes into uh, this. So we have children, and they are mapped across um, the brown children who are Indians and the other boy who reads a Bible who has lighter skin. And we have Romana, the housekeeper, who has brown skin, and Candida, who is, uh, has light skin and has a more maybe sort of decadent quality and presumably is not the preference of the artist in this sense. Um, now here is a painting also from 1935, although it was reworked somewhat in later, um, that shows an American lady. Tasco was a town that had lots of American tourists. Um, and here the American lady is assuming that, uh, that role of the white other. Um, and, uh, and so this, the, again, the jewelry versus the, you know, the bare feet versus the high heel shoes, that kind of I have a headache sort of worldly sense uh, versus the here's a flower. Um, and then there's another preference that comes in to his thinking because um, uh, people would come and, and say, Tamiji, what, why, why did you come to this poor country from America? You could have stayed there. Isn't that a better place for you? And, um, and here again, the language is very colorful. Uh, in, um, uh, in cold New York, uh, there's, this is prohibition. I guess he experienced prohibition. Um, and prostitutes are too expensive. But in Mexico, I need in Mexico, in the hot country of Mexico, the germs and the passion. 
So there is this definite kind of romance of the South, this North-South kind of dynamic that intersects with this brown skin, white skin dialectic as well. Um, <clears throat> now, he goes back to Japan. And in Japan, he paints Mexican figures again. In Japan, he is known as this Mexican Japanese painter. And a, a, one critic says, this guy has the scent of Mexico about him, uh, this nioi. Um, uh, but look at the difference. They're both uh, these young women. Um, they both have large heads. But there's some more finessing of this motif that goes on in Tokyo. The, uh, they're sitting on the ground, but their hands and arms are folded in. They're dressed with their rebozo. And um, the uh, girl in the white dress has a hibiscus flower that's an ornamental quality. And we see the landscape of Pasco around them and kind of nice uh, treatment of the borders of the composition. Um, so it's kind of like making it a little more pretty relative to Romana. But it uh, is very different from what is known in uh, Tokyo. And it's not this Mexican scent is too strong. So it takes a long time for him to enter uh, the art world and become accepted. Yasui Sotaro is a very famous uh, painter. And his young Japanese woman in this picture is the kind of thing that was highly esteemed in this milieu, and Kitagawa was coming in from a very different context. Ten years later, he readapts the same composition of three young women sitting on the ground. But now they're Japanese women. And now the women uh, are uh, motifs that, uh, uh, that uh, entail a vi vision of early post-war Japan and the hardship, like weeds, zasso no yoni. Um, three women with, uh, now the style is changed in a new kind of uh, deformation. The hands are thickened, the limbs are bent, and um, it seemed as a kind of hardy suffering that also entails this, um, uh, th th this Mexican sensibility that is still apparent, but now deployed for a contemporary Japanese reality. Um, my next, uh, my third painter is Fukuzawa Ichiro. And uh, he practices the deformation of the uh, female body in a very different way. He brings uh, these instruments of the Enlightenment um, uh, to come crashing down on the, uh, the, the form of the beautiful woman. Um, and this uh, relates very closely to Max Ernst and surrealism. Fukuzawa is sometimes regarded as uh, the uh, first leading surrealist painter in Japan for this, uh, this painting and the others that were part of the group he painted in Paris in 1930 after looking at Max Ernst's collage novel, The Hundred Headless Woman, and, um, and then uh, borrowing this idea from pa paper, rip paper collage into the compositional system of the oil painted forms. Um, and he draws on Diderot's encyclopedia. Actually, there's another um, page that is very close to the background of this room that the figure is standing in on the left. But um, rather, he takes these tools, these instruments that in the Enlightenment context should extend the human uh, knowledge and understanding, and he reverses their impact on the seat of intelligence. So the filings stuck to a magnet, they um, blind the woman and nullify her intelligence. Um, uh, so this is the, uh, the system of uh, defamiliarization that he absorbs from European surrealism. But back in Japan, he turns it on to a different kind of subject. Um, 
the Chinese figure here is a product of his visit to northern China in um, 1940 um, when he said he cut off his stay in Beijing and went to Shaanxi in search of the primitive and barbarous and was touched by what he expected to find. Um, so here that search for the other is an abject, a subaltern Chinese other in the context of um, Japanese imperialism. Now, I'm going to abbreviate this, this part, and frankly, I think it's because I was um, uh, kind of upset about the relationship between these distraught images uh, of Fukuzawa's in the period of the war and the aftermath of the war and what's going on in Japan today. So I kind of knew that I was going to abbreviate this section and spend more time on uh, uh, Kitagawa. Um, uh, and I have kind of gone over time. I'm just going to end there by pointing out that each of these expeditions, whether it's Matsuoka in Italy in the 1880s, or Kitagawa in Mexico in the 1930s, or Fukuzawa in Paris, but then in China in the, in the 1930s and 40s, each of these expeditions in search of bodies of otherness, um, they culminate, you might say, in bodies of self-identification. So that we have the father, uh, the, the, the artist's own father, produced from the uh, body techniques that are acquired in Europe. And we have these um, Japanese women expressing their condition in occupied Japan um, after Kitagawa's experience in Mexico. And what I abbreviated here is Fukuzawa's acquisition of surrealist defamiliarization and then the projection of that uh, onto an, a, a barbaric, in his words, uh, abject Chinese subaltern. And then in the aftermath of Japanese war defeat, um, this kind of symbolic figure of a Japanese uh, uh, air pilot who has been downed and his body is sort of moldifying and at the same time molten with a eerie surrealist implication of transcendence for future national power, in his words, kokuryoku national power. Um, and I will stop there. Thank you very much.